Welcome to the Fit Vegan Podcast, the show where we help you optimize your health, fitness, and mindset on a whole food plant-based lifestyle. My name is Maxim Sigoy. I am a former triathlete, powerlifter, bodybuilder, and basketball player, and I've been vegan for over nine years. I'm also the founder and CEO of Fit Vegan Coaching, which has helped over 500 vegans from 20 different countries to completely transform their bodies and their health. I'm excited for you to hear today's episode. Let's get into the show. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Fit Vegan Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Sonia Looney. Did I pronounce it right? Yep. Sonia Lasagna. Lo- vegan lasagna, though. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, especially on this show. Um so Sonia is a world champion and professional mountain bike racer. She's a health and performance coach. She's a plant-based athlete. She's a keynote speaker and podcast host. Sonia, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, it's a sunny day. I got to ride my bike this morning and um, we got an, a cargo e-bike as well. So the kids kind of go on the back and my husband and the kids started off the ride with me today. And the look on the kids' faces, the smiles, like that powered me through the whole morning. Oh, nice. Yeah. We've been looking at getting an e-bike, um, for my fiance so she can keep up and kind of ride with me. So it's the same thing for you, I guess, for your husband to be able to kind of keep up with the kids. Yeah. Oh, it's so much fun. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, you know, you have a really impressive life resume, if you want to put it that way. And I know we had the opportunity to connect on your show, I think like a few weeks ago, which is when we realized that we both live in the same town for like almost eight (laughs) months and we never met until I moved to LA. I know it always works out that way, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah. So next time I'm in Squamish, I'll come and say hi. Or if you come to to LA. Um, So you're into mountain biking and obviously plant-based eating. So I wanted to know which one came first. Was it like racing and then you discovered plant-based eating or were you plant-based and kind of discovered the mountain biking after? Mountain bike racing came first. So I found mountain biking in 2003, kind of by accident. I was, um, I grew up playing tennis and really being more of an academic and a musician in school. And, uh, I decided to run a marathon when I was 17 or I started training, I guess when I was 17 and ran it at 18 and was going to spin class at the gym. Cause I didn't really know how to train. And these yeah. guys from my work invited me to go mountain biking. And I thought, shoot, well, I've run a marathon. So I'll try this mountain biking thing. And that was 20 years ago. And I found plant-based nutrition 10 years ago. So for half of my mountain biking career now, I have been plant-based. Okay. So little did they know they introduced you to mountain biking and you become a world champion. Yeah. Little did I know either. (laughs) And so how was, so what was the reason for you transitioning to to eating plant-based? Was it health, animals, recovery? What was that, that kind of like initial switch for you? Yeah. So interestingly enough, I was a bit judgmental whenever I heard the word vegan, I I was living in Boulder, Colorado at the time. And I had had sort of judgmental experiences with other vegans. So whenever I met my now husband at BC bike race in 2012 and found out that he was a vegan, I was a little bit hesitant about the whole thing, but he told me about this documentary forks over knives, which many listeners have heard of. And I thought, well, I guess I better check it out. So I watched it and I thought, man, if this is true, I really need to change my diet right away. So I started digging in a little bit more, but I was a bit nervous because I thought, well, there's not really any endurance athletes that I know that are professionals that are eating this way. Like what if something goes wrong? Like what if this is optimal for my health, but what if it's not optimal for my performance? So Mm -hmm. I really approached it slowly. Um, and we can get into that if you like. For sure. Well, so multiple things to that. I'm curious as to what was the part about forks over knife that connected with you? What was it that was like, ah, that makes sense to me from a health standpoint? Yeah, like family history or something like that? Yeah, like a lot of times you think about, well, I think about death a lot, like not in a negative way, but just death gives our lives meaning. And a lot of a lot of ways that would scare me about how people would die would be cancer or like there was heart disease in my family. And I thought, this is this is crazy that we don't have any control over this. It's just bad luck if you get cancer, which for some people it is. But whenever I learned um, after watching Forks Over Knives that there is a lot of dietary and lifestyle interventions that you can make in order to set yourself up for the best possible scenario, I thought, well, a lot of this actually is within my control. And if that's the case, then I need to do everything I can because I want to be kicking butt in my 70s and 80s and 90s. And I want to give myself the best chance to have a good life. And how old were you when you made that transition? I was 30. 
or okay, 29, lot, I guess. Because a lot of people don't start to think about that at that mm -hmm. age, right? And so now I, I would like to talk about the performance aspect of like, I want to mm -hmm. do it for health reasons, but I'm scared it's going to affect my performance. That's the story for like all the athletes that are recently hearing that plant-based eating is the thing, right? It'll reduce inflammation, speed up your recovery, but people still have their doubt because obviously they never ate like that before. So what was your initial approach to transitioning with that, that fear in mind? And then how would you do it differently now that you know everything that you know? I mean, I, I think everybody's sort of transition, whether they go hundred percent or not is different. Like my husband transitioned overnight. Like when he first found that forks over knives, he threw out everything. And he, in fact, he was, he was so extreme. He, he threw out any spice that had oil in it. So, you know, there are the people that need the extremes, but for me, I needed to be gradual. So I decided, okay, I'm going to just do breakfast plant-based and see how I feel. Then I'm going to just do breakfast and lunch plant-based and see how I feel. So I slowly over time transitioned it out and it took about three months to go fully plant-based. And I was also worried about saying, I'm never going to, you know, I'm never going to eat meat or dairy again. Like that sort of definitive statement was limiting for me. And I was afraid, um, well, what if I change my mind in the future? And something interesting that a lot of people don't know is I didn't tell anybody about how I ate for four years. So I was eating plant-based for four years before I finally said, you know what? I really need to speak and tell people this is how I'm eating. Cause I'm really passionate about it. And I'm afraid I was afraid that people would think that I was judging them if they didn't do things the same way that I did. Yeah. Um, but really it ended up being a really positive thing to start sharing that. How did you hide that for four years? Because a lot of people are scared to go to family gathering and try to eat vegan, but not say anything to their family. And they think someone's going to notice. So how did you get under the radar for four years? Yeah, actually. So I wasn't hiding it from my family, but like, uh, you know, as my persona, as an athlete, that just ah, okay. wasn't something that ever came up. I wasn't like going out there and waving the vegan flag saying, Hey, this is how I'm eating. Uh, I, I just sort of kept that to myself. But the interesting thing is that I was worried that I was going to get slower or I wasn't going to recover from my workouts or maybe, you know, all this fiber was going to mess me up. And that wasn't the case. I was surprised to see that I was going from trying to get on the podium at races, you know, really trying hard to get third place racing for that, that bottom step to winning races and ultimately becoming world champion in 2015 in the 24 hour racing discipline, which many people would think, well, there's no way you can eat plant-based and have enough energy to race your bike for 24 hours straight. Yeah. Which that's crazy. So was that like, I'm sure there's slightly other variables, but that was the main variable that you changed that kind of allow you to, to start standing on the podium. It was the only variable that I had changed actually. Like everything else was the same. My training was the same. Um, the type of racing I was doing was the same. The amount of sleep I was getting was the same. It just, it was just an unexpected thing that happened. That's crazy. So was it, was it that you were recovering faster so you can train harder to next sessions? Was it that you're just making more, like you were just building more muscle, building more strength faster? Like what are the differences that you notice that allowed you ultimately to, to see this big jump in your performance? I think it's multiple things. Like number one, the healthier, healthier you are, the more vitality you have and therefore the better you can perform. So if your brain is functioning better, if your heart is functioning better, that's going to help you. And especially in endurance sports, whenever you need your, your heart to be functioning well, you need to have as much blood, blood flow as possible to the muscles. You need to recover as quickly as possible. And the anti-inflammatory nature of the diet itself, I think is really um, beneficial, especially for athletes. Yeah. Well, that's powerful. And how many years were you until you're racing? At, at I was that 10, point? 10 years into my racing career. And so at the 10 year, even with 10 years of training, you change one thing and then it makes a significant difference between you mm -hmm. not being on a podium and starting to to win ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we can talk about this later, but I also had kids in the last three years. I've, I've had two kids and both pregnancies were entirely plant-based and the symptoms of pregnancy that are typically unfavorable for many people. I never experienced any of those with both of my kids. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about that, but I'd like to dive a bit more into like the racing because I was reading mm -hmm. on your website. So you raced your bike across 25 different countries in some of the hardest entrance races in places like the dunes of Sahara Desert, rugged Himalayas of Nepal and the jungles in Asia, Mongolia the mountains in, in Poland. And it, all of that was plant based for all of it or for the most part? Uh, all except for maybe one race because I started traveling the world right around when I started changing my diet. 
Okay. And so how, what did the fueling look like? Because the main thing that I want to bring to, to the listeners is, you know, when you talk about improving your body composition or training for a performance, it's a different, it's a different ball game, right? You do approach nutrition slightly differently. So what does, what does that look like when you're looking to fuel these events? And are those, so let's go over the duration. Are those 24 hour races? Are those like seven day races? What, what kind of distances were we, are we talking about? Yeah. So multi-day stage racing is usually about seven days and it varies in distance depending on the technicality of the terrain, but it can be in terms of hours, anywhere from, you know, 20 hours to 35 hours of racing in a week for a winning female time. Okay. It's a lot of hours. That's a lot of fuel that you need to do that. So how mm -hmm. do you fuel something like that? <laughs> I wish I had something that sounded really complex and fancy, but you just eat as much as you can. And I mean, you want to be eating carbohydrate rich food. So complex carbohydrates are good before the race. You want to be having simple carbohydrates, but I don't really monitor, you know, my intake of food. Like I, whenever I'm at a stage race, I just eat as much as I can. And that might mean that I'm eating, you know, a little bit lower fiber food so that I can take in more foods. But basically yeah. when I'm traveling to a foreign country, like, well, a lot of it is like, you know, rice and lentils or tofu and rice, or, you know, lots of like bread and nut butter. And it's just really simple foods. And the, the more foreign the race, the more simple the food got and some things that I had Playing to do. It safe. Yeah. And some things that I had to do because these races cater the food. So like some of the races back in the earlier days of this didn't provide a vegan option at the, at the races, or if they did, the portion was so incredibly small that there's no way that you could get the amount of calories that you need. So I would always have multiple jars of almond butter with me when I travel because there's that's high calorie density. Um, yeah. and there's, there's good stuff in there for, for, you know, pre-race and even post-race. And I knew I'd always be able to find bread, uh, at the races where you were staying in a hotel, which some races you're not, you're like staying in like, um, a yurt in Mongolia. Like there's no power out there, but yeah. the ones where I did, like I would bring a, a, a portable rice cooker in my bag and I knew that I'd be able to find like rice and beans. So I would prepare my own food. Um, and it would be really quick and easy. Cause it's like a rice cooker with a steam basket and just make all my own food for the races. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't, I didn't expect the answer to be complex because ultimately, you know, it's <laughs> basic fundamentals, especially at that point, you're right. Like you're burning so much that it's like, let's not even worry about counting calories or anything. We're just get as much in as we can so that we have enough energy to continue going and push as hard as we can. Mm -hmm. I think that people like complex, fancy answers though. So for they the do. listener who is like so excited <laughs> about like, oh yeah, let's get into it. It's like, well, it's not as I take this as amount of sodium before and I do drink <laughs> yeah. this amount of water. Like, nah, you just, yeah. you stuff your face of whatever you can as much as you can. So you can yeah. keep going. <laughs> yeah. So obviously like I, I do understand a lot of people maybe want to understand that part of it, taking in low fiber when you're, when you're trying to race. But it's a lot on the gut to take a really high amount of fiber, especially when you're doing that long of races. And it's so filling that you're right. You can't get as many calories as you're supposed to be getting in, which is, and I know you recommend this, like for people, don't do that unless you're trying to race, right? Like <laughs> fiber is good for you. If you're trying to race mm -hmm. and stuff yourself, it's a different ball game. But that's why people have a different insight as to what's needed to be able to perform some of these events. And also people's tolerance to handle fiber is really different. Like I can handle a lot more fiber than my husband can. Like the night before a race, I can, I can have a high fiber meal and be, be great and good to go the next day. And he can't do that. So I think it's understanding your own body. Yeah, absolutely. So does your husband race with you mountain, uh, mountain biking as well? Yeah, he also races. Yeah. He races, uh, in the age group category, but he does quite well in the age group category. Oh, that's cause he's vegan. That's why. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> Yeah. He, I mean, he has, he has his own stories of how, you know, changing his diet has completely changed his life. And I was already eating pretty healthily before I changed my diet. I, I mean, I was, I was still eating, you know, obviously animal products, but I wasn't really eating a lot of processed foods. I tried making all my own food at home and I ate lots of fruits and vegetables, but for him, you know, he would eat fast food. He would, he just, he didn't really eat fruit or vegetables or anything like that. So for the people that changed their diet from that end of the spectrum, I think that's so inspiring because that's a complete 180 in your, not only in your diet, but in your life. Like, I think the effects of changing your diet are way more um, apparent whenever you make that kind of switch. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so talking about like family going plant-based, you mentioned you had your two kids basically eating plant-based. How, how was that? Cause I, I could sense that there was a lot of passion there. 
Yeah. I mean, everybody has their opinions about how you're doing things and it started with pregnancy. So uh, I had my first kid in 2020 and my second kid in 2022. And people were asking me, you're eating vegan while you're pregnant. Like, isn't that dangerous for the baby? And of course I had done, there's a lot of really great books out there on, on vegan. There's even one called vegan pregnancy. I can't remember the author's name, but it's fantastic. And it's interesting if you think about all of the requirements or recommendations of, around pregnancy, the, the way that you're supposed to eat. And if you, if you look into that a little bit, you're actually supposed to eat as close to plant-based as you can, because it's the healthiest way to eat. So for me, it, it actually wasn't a difficult thing at all. And people would ask like, well, what if you crave meat or something whenever you're pregnant? And I just, I don't crave stuff like that. And I didn't, and I didn't have you know, there was zero worry of, uh, gestational diabetes. There was no preeclampsia and, you know, high, high blood pressure during pregnancy. Um, I had no swelling at all. Like my rings were still loose on my fingers. I was able to mountain bike until the day before each of my children were born. Um, so I had a really positive, it, certainly pregnancy for me, isn't like a fun time. Uh, and you are tired and you have all these things. It's not, it's not like you don't feel like you're pregnant, but some of these potential, you know, challenges that, that people have, and, and maybe people have experienced some of these challenges, um, that did eat plant-based during pregnancy, but I, I didn't. So that was a pretty cool thing to see. And also, you know, my, both of my children have been plant-based since birth. They've never had an animal product. And if in the future, if they decide they want to do that, that's going to be their choice, but at home, like this is how we're going to eat. Yeah. So I'd be careful about what I speak about here, because obviously <laughs> it's not my, my space to talk to, uh, as a, as a man, but what I've noticed is people will always give a little bit more shit to the, to the moms that are eating plant-based during pregnancy. But on the flip side, if you see a mom that is eating at like McDonald's and Burger Kings and kind of eating all these foods, no one's ever going to say anything. And mm -hmm. so to me, I think it's just more like logical at this point is like, what, which one is the one you think is going to be best for you and your kid? I think the answer is a clear, they clearly know that eating kind of like those processed foods is not the best. But because it's the norm, we disregard it as a bad thing, right? And so mm -hmm. I'm with you on the plant-based side. So it was for the moms that are listening, I know. So how can I put this? We've had a lot of moms come into the program and moms that wanted to be get pregnant, had a hard time, came into the program, eat whole food, plant-based, changed, got a baby. We have a few fit vegan babies, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. That is the best way to put it. But for those uh, uh, of the moms that are listening or that want to have babies, what are books or resources that they should look into to kind of have that knowledge and that comfortability and, and get a bit more certainty of like, oh, I want to do it this way versus this way. I mean, there's a book called Your Complete Vegan Pregnancy, Your All-in-One Guide to a Healthy, Holistic, Plant-Based Pregnancy by Reed Mangles, and she's a PhD and an RD. Also, I recommend the book Nourish by uh, Brenda Davis, and she also wrote it with a pediatrician. And plant-based juniors is another fantastic resource. And I, actually, if if the, if they want it, I wrote um, the ultimate guide to vegan pregnancy on my website, where I took all this information and put it into basically a cheat sheet for people who wanted to have a vegan pregnancy. Perfect. Well, I'll link everything in the show notes for people listening. And if you're on YouTube as well, I'll put it there. I'll have your link at the top, and I'll have the books for Amazon below after, just so people can have the information. Because like I said, it's a topic I don't talk about too often because it's mm -hmm. kind of like a gray area <laughs> coming from <laughs> me. So I appreciate that you brought it up. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I actually had people change their diet to vegan while they were pregnant as well and have positive benefits from that. Yeah. I just don't think you can go wrong yet. I don't know. We've been <laughs> vegan for a very long time. Yeah. So obviously know the benefits. And I was talking with someone about this, like vegans gain we don't gain anything on a personal level from getting other people to go vegan. It's just like, we feel so good that we want that for the people that we love. Like we don't mm -hmm. financially gain out of anyone going vegan. We don't like, there's no benefits to our life besides knowing that the people that we love get the benefit of how good they can feel, which mm -hmm. you never really hear that from any other types of lifestyle. Ultimately. That's a good point. <laughs> Right. Like we're so you know, we think of that, vegans believe that that belief is so strong that we'll go above and beyond to try to educate and to help people, even though like we have another career, we have families, other things, we're, they're always going to go above and beyond to educate and help people when they gain nothing from it. It's just out of pure love mm -hmm. of wanting the world to to be a better place. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, you're a, a performance coach as well. 
All right, so you've coached a lot of people. As I said, I was speaking on your website before you've coached Reggie Miller, which I kind of like nerded <laughs> out a little bit because um, excellent NBA player. So I'm sure you've worked with you worked with professional athletes for a fact, and I'm sure you've worked with non-professional athletes before. What's the difference in mindset that you notice between the two of them? And obviously you're a professional athlete as well. So I know there's something in here in between your two ears that wires you to perform at this certain level, but what's kind of the differences that you notice um, that people can kind of take and try to implement for themselves? I think that's a great question. And I think that comes down to probably two things, openness and curiosity. Like I, w- I wish I could say self-belief is the difference, but you can be a professional athlete and lack self-belief and self-belief isn't something that, that is, that you always have. Um, but being open to trying new things and to listening to somebody else's experience and being curious about what happens next and then being consistent, the consistency piece, you can accomplish so much in your life if you're just consistent. And that could be one of the hardest things to do because whenever we want to prioritize something, especially something that is health related, like sleep or food or something like that, that tends to be one of the first things to go whenever our lives get busy and it's no longer a priority, even though we say it is. So for professional athletes, when they say that something is important and something is a priority, it becomes a priority no matter what. So how would, how would one go about building that consistency, right? Cause I always like to say consistency compounds. You know, if you have a goal that takes you six months, if you have many moments where you fall and go off the wagon, well, if you never fail, you can't quit. So whatever it takes you two years, eventually you'll just end up getting there. But how do you, how do you approach building consistency into people's life? There's lots of ways uh, that I do this. So first is making a goal attainable and, and making it a process action oriented goal. So a lot of times we'll set a goal that is, that seems very big. Like uh, say, here's an example. I want to run a marathon. That's a common goal for a lot of people, but that can seem insurmountable on the days where you feel so tired that you can barely even get out the door. So instead of saying, I want to run a marathon, you can say, I want to run for 10 minutes every day. And 10 minutes certainly isn't enough time to train for a marathon, but making it such a small achievable goal where you're going to show up no matter what, even if it's only for 10 minutes that's going to help burn in that consistency piece. Because whenever you make a promise to yourself, I'm going to do this thing. And then you don't do that thing. Then you can't trust yourself anymore. So it's really about committing to the thing that you say you're going to do. And in in my health and wellness coaching, it's all about behavior change and helping people set small achievable goals that compound into big things. And a lot of times that goal is just too big and, and it can be really hard whenever you fall out of practice doing that. And then celebrating and reviewing that you of, of what you did, because most of the time we don't celebrate our successes or we think that these small actions that we took don't matter because they don't feel like big things when we're doing them. But if you take a moment to look back at what you've achieved or what progress you've made, you'll find that it's that those small things are re- actually really big things. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's why I'm happy to have you on the podcast, because for the people listening, I don't bring on people I don't align with for the most part in terms of like transformation. What I mean by that is, you know, as much as me that it's not about the plan, right? The plan is one part of the transformation of training for the marathon, but it's the adherence to the plan that makes a difference, right? It's actually doing it. That's going to get you ready for the thing. So it all comes down to behavior. And so how do you Obviously, addressing the behavior is one part, but how do you address some of those changes in behavior? So for the people that are listening, for example, they want to they want to train for a marathon, which I have a lot of endurance athletes that that follow me just because my background and kind of triathlon and Ironman. Some people want to do a race for the first time, right? Mm-hmm. How do you kind of address that behavior change for people that want to get going that have zero momentum? Yeah. I mean, it comes down to number one, showing up and making it fun and not putting so much pressure on yourself and not comparing yourself. So if you're brand new, like if you're a brand new runner and you think that you need to be as good as your neighbor or somebody else, and you're comparing your starting point with where somebody else already is, that can completely kill your motivation and the belief that you have in yourself and also and the joy. Rec- and the joy and the yeah. Journey. And also recognizing like, no matter who you are, whether you're just getting started or you're somebody who's a world champion, this, I did something, I recorded something on this today. Like your process is never going to be perfect. Like you're going to have your plan, like that piece of paper that you held up, 
but it's not always going to be a hundred percent adherence to the plan. But what's important is you show up and you do your best. And I think defining what your best is, defining what success means to you with whatever endeavor that you're going for is really important because a lot of times people could say, well, success is running a certain time or success is getting a certain place. And that can be one of the definitions of success. But what about success, meaning being like, I showed up for all of my workouts or I got the best out of myself and I'm proud of the person I've become. Like success can be something that's very defined by a time or an outcome. But a lot of times you can't control those things. Like you could sign up for a marathon. There could be things that go wrong that are out of your control. And this certainly happens in mountain bike racing. So yeah. at the end of the day, you know, if you don't get that outcome, how can you still find success and wins and the things that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes the course is just hillier and it just takes you longer mm -hmm. to bike up it or run up it than it would if you ran a flat race somewhere else. Um, have, have you ever done that? So I did that. I know a lot of people kind of potentially fell on that role. Like it's your first few races and you're racing. You're like, oh, I only took me five hours and a half. Like this other guy, this other guy did it in like five hours and 15. Like I should have gone five hours and 15 if I should, I didn't do this or that, or if I prep better or whatever, you just beat yourself up. You just complete, for example, like a half Ironman or a, or a marathon and you still beat yourself up. Even though it's your first one, you've completed it. You didn't walk, you ran the whole way through. Have you ever had those moments when you got into a sport? Of course. And I mean, that comparison is just always there. And even whenever you win a race, like you just reject your success because there's this perfectionist ideal that it should have been better. Or I won the race, but it doesn't count because so-and-so wasn't there. And I think that a lot of us will belittle our accomplishments, but you can't do that because there's always going to be somebody that's better than you that didn't show up. There's always going to be a way that you could have done it better. But that's why it's so important to set those process-based goals at the very beginning um, of your training and, and of the event that you're doing, because then you can look back at those and say, did I do those? Did I not do those? And what can I learn from this? Instead of, well, so-and-so wasn't there, or I should have been 10 minutes faster, instead of being proud of the things that you actually set out to do. Is there something you tell yourself before your race? Because now I understand it's different because you're at a professional level. I'm sure there's cash prizes if you win races, so not a bit of like your living is tied to it. But for the people that don't necessarily make a living out of the sport and that if they don't win a race or win it or win for their age group, it doesn't really change anything financially for them. Is there something that you would tell yourself or that you do tell yourself before you start a race to make sure that you actually kind of like enjoy the process and once you're done, regardless of what the outcome is, like you're mentally in a good place? Yeah. I mean, I think asking yourself, what would be a win for me? And that, that extends to like relationships to anything, like what, not necessarily like winning the overall race, but like what are some things that would make today a good day? And how do I want to feel? How do I want to show up? Because you can control your effort. You can control your actions. You can control your attitude and you can set goals around those things. And that's irregardless of an outcome or what somebody else does. And looking at training and building consistency when it comes to racing or just any workouts in general, like you mentioned earlier, there's days where you just don't want to show up. Like you don't want to get out of the door. You don't want to put your running shoes or your, your, your gym clothes on. The body is sore. It's tired sometimes. How do you get through those days? Motivation follows action. <laughs> I set the, I make the goal showing up. And this was really something that was a big part of my pregnancy because there's a lot of days you do not feel like getting on your bike. You don't feel like going out the door. Everybody else is sitting on the couch, you know, like, but if you just say, I'm going to show up, I'm going to get dressed, I'm going to show up. And then I'm going to decide how long I'm going to do it. That lowers that barrier so low so that you can't make excuses as to not go. And, mm -hmm. um, if anybody listening has read atomic habits or like by James clear, there's a story in the book where like, there was this guy who was trying to get in the habit of going to the gym. And for a while, his goal was just to drive to the gym and not even go inside because it was just burning in the pathway of showing up. And even myself, you know, I, I now I'm like still, still performing at the top level. There's days I don't want to go out. I'd rather stay with my kids. Like this morning I was zipping up my bike jersey and my daughter was crying. My one-year-old daughter was crying because she now she knows what that means when I'm putting that jersey on. Mm -hmm. And it would have been a lot easier to stay home and to, you know, play with my daughter. And I would have enjoyed that. But the type I asked myself, what, who do I want to be? And what are my values? And, and what are my goals? And what's important to me? And of course, my daughter is very important to me. But it's also important to me to go do this thing because it's a big part of who I am. 
So I tell myself I'm going to show up. And if I, if I feel bad after 15 minutes or five minutes, I'm going to turn around and go home. And if I feel good, well, guess what? You're probably going to do more. And I'm sure everybody listening, like, like if you're, if you're going to do like pull-ups or something or push-ups, you know, if you look uh, on your plan, you have to do like a hundred push-ups. It seems like too many. So do one push-up, and one will turn to five, five will turn to 20 and yeah, just show up. Like <laughs> it's, it sounds very simple, but it can be really hard whenever we, our head gets in the way. Yeah. So just reframing the perception of like, I'm not trying to step on top of this mountain in one go. I'm not trying to do a hundred pushups in one go. I'm trying to just do one at a time. Mm -hmm. So talking about like you zipping that Jersey and your daughter kind of like realizing what that means, you made me think of, uh, you know, the whole caregiver energy that, that moms had that kind of, I had my experience with, with, with my ex-partner. How does you taking care of yourself and making sure that your cup is full allow you to be a better parent than a better mom? Because so many people struggle with that. Like I need to put my kids first. I need to put other people first. And then they forget themselves in the process and they just give, 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 give. Their cup gets empty. And over time, they stop taking care of themselves. They put on weight and eventually they wake up one day and they're like, oh shit, what happened? Um, and then it's, then it's a, the process of making them realize of like, hey, if you take care of yourself, you can actually be a better parent. You can actually be a better partner. So how does that dynamic help you of you taking care of yourself and then showing up for your family? I'm so glad that you asked this question because this is a really challenging space for anybody to be in whenever somebody, somebody that you love needs you and your presence will make them feel better. Even if you skip the thing that you need to do to take care of yourself and you can simultaneously feel sad or guilty that you're skipping, um, that time, like not spending that time with them. And you can feel happy and fulfilled by doing this other thing. But I asked myself, you know, what example, like in terms of kids, you know, what example do I want to set for my kids? Like, I don't want to be vacant that I'm always gone. And they think that my bike riding is more important than them. And there's certainly a balance to that, but like, I want them to see me working hard and, and uh, like pushing myself because hopefully that'll inspire them to do the same thing. And then number two, if I don't do that, like there's been days where I have skipped my workout because I felt bad. And then I ask myself at the end of the day, again, it's like in inquiry, like self inquiry. How am I showing up now that I skipped that? How am I showing up in this relationship if I skip that thing? And the answer is I don't feel good about myself and I'm not showing up and I'm a bit resentful and I'm not the person that I want to be if I can't do this thing to take care of myself. And that thing to take care of yourself, it could be, you know, a 30 minute workout. It could be a 10 minute meditation. It could be a five hour ride. Like you have to define what that is for you. And, um, not listening to what other people say, like I did this, I, there's this uh, documentary that I filmed called benched and it's about kind of the perils of athlete motherhood and identity. And it's been touring around the world at film festivals for the last year. And in the film, I say, someone actually sent me a message telling me that I was so selfish to go out and ride my bike whenever I had a baby at home. But mm -hmm. I knew what kind of mom that it makes me whenever I go do that versus if I don't do that. Yeah. So it, it sounds like one thing I'm realizing, like athletes are people that kind of are in that field, have a lot more self-awareness as to how they're feeling and their emotions and how they're processing them. I feel like a lot of people tend to be numb and it will just go with life, right? Like my kids need me, all these things are happening. I just need to be with them. And then that, and there's a bit of a numbness, a lack of awareness. So like, what are the things that I need to do to make sure that I'm good so I can better take care of the other people? Because people think that it's, it's selfish for you to go ride your bike. It's selfish for you to go and work out. It's selfish for you to prep food that would be healthier for you versus, you know, go back out to McDonald's to eat with the rest of the family, whatever it may be. And so now I appreciate you sharing that because it is that is it it is a taboo to, to talk about. Um, but ultimately, I've only seen great stories of people being able to fill their cup, take care of themselves and then be able to take care of their kids. Because I don't have kids, right? I always to be upfront about that. But as a caregiver, I realized that if I did do the things to fill my cup, I had resentment towards my partner. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what's better? Me being there and having resentment or me doing my thing and then better being able to be there after. Yeah. And yeah, again, coming coming back to that curiosity piece and self-curiosity. Like how how do I feel when I do this? How do I feel when I don't do this? And like the same question that I that we said to ask yourself at the beginning of a, an event 
know, how do I want to feel? How do I want to show up? And then evaluating because that might change. Like it might, the amount that you want to do things for yourself might change over time and continually coming back to that so that you have intent with your actions instead of just doing something like using your words, like in a numb way or without any awareness or, um, or being deliberate. Yeah. And for people to realize there's nothing wrong if it does change, mm -hmm. right? It's normal. So I like, I love to talk because you've coached a lot of people, right? And we talked about like behavior changes, how that's a, such a big fundamental. So of all the people that, that you've coached and throughout all your experiences, I know it's built a lot of knowledge, like actual, like practical knowledge, um, that now you can share again, things that people can actually implement. So where are the top three things I was going to do top five at first, but I was like, I think it's a lot. This is like the top three things that are the most valuable that if anyone has any desire to want to improve themselves, either as a mother, as an athlete, um, as a partner or whatever it may be, because I know that these principles apply far outside of just fitness and nutrition. What are like some of the top traits um, or the top tools that you would teach to someone to be able to kind of master these areas of their life? Some of them we've already talked about the biggest, I, I always ask people at the end of a coaching session, what their big takeaway was for them. And every single time <laughs> I would say like, okay, 95% of the time people say, I didn't realize that something so small, that doing something so small would make such a big impact on my life. So that goes back to setting those, uh, those smart goals, the specific measurable action oriented, realistic and time bound goals that are, are small, but that you're committed to. So that's one and making sure that you revisit the successes with those. Number two is prioritizing and having clarity around what it is that you're doing, because many of us have lots of different things going on in our lives. We're passionate about many different things. Nobody just does one thing. <laughs> so knowing what it is that you want to prioritize and what you want that to look like and having that, that vision, um, so that you can create a roadmap to get there is super powerful and being flexible whenever that vision or that roadmap changes, because inevitably it will. And then number three, having compassion, self-compassion. Like I know that's a buzzword and a lot of people talk about it, but many people when they're striving for more can be incredibly hard on themselves and can compare and can say, well, you know, I can't believe that it didn't go this way or I I'm not enough or I have to achieve this thing so I can feel like I'm enough. So how can you use compassion to say when things aren't going your way, because that will be part of the journey. It's okay it's okay for this to happen. And I'm still a good person and I'm going to keep trying. Yeah. I feel like some of the people that achieve the highest are the ones that suck a little bit more at self-compassion. I feel like they're the ones that beat themselves up the most often. Have you found that to be true throughout kind of like your years of coaching? I think it just depends on the type of person. Like if somebody has actually spent a lot of the time working on themselves, they tend to be more compassionate. Some people are afraid that if they let go of this highly critical berating voice that the they are going to lose their, yeah, they're going to lose their edge, but actually research shows that the opposite is true. Yeah. So actually that's a great point because I had that for the longest time. Hmm. Have you ever had that part where you felt that if you were kinder to yourself or more compassionate, that like your drive that caused you to be this world champion and to accomplish would, would dwindle away? Yeah. I mean the, the type of, so self-talk. So I have like my health and wellness coaching, but I also have mental performance coaching and those are two different types of things. So part of mental performance is self-talk and your explanatory style and how you make sense of the world, the world. And if yourself, like a lot of people use negative self-talk, like they cuss at themselves, they like yell at themselves in their own head, or maybe even out loud, um, so that they can achieve something. And that, that might work in the short term, but that actually is not good for a long-term motivation. And I used to be that way. I used to say mean things to myself on the race course to try to help me go faster. And I worked really hard to not do that. And now I have a, a very positive headspace uh, most of the time, not all the time. And I noticed that I perform better and self-talk whenever you use, there's two types, there's motivational self-talk. So like saying things in third person, like Sonia, you're doing great, or you got this, or, you know, just pass, you, you can pass the next person. Like you trained hard for this or instructional self-talk giving yourself instructions, you know, um, on your form or on a skill in order to execute that skill. Like those two types of self-talk are not negative and people might be thinking, okay, well, what about flow? Like flow? It's, it's almost like no self-talk. It's like, no mind. You're just doing the thing. So there's no room for negativity 
in, in flow state, there's no room for negativity in a positive headspace either. Yeah. So, so for you on a personal level, you've noticed a difference in, in your mm. drive. So instead of it, it, it being driven by negativity or trauma, whatever it may be, it was mm. more, does it feel like more like a pulling or more like a pushing? Cause negative self-talk feels more like you're running away from something versus running towards something. Is there a different feeling to it? Yeah. For me, it's, it's not really a pulling or a pushing. It's a constricting or an opening. And whenever you, you feel open and you feel broad, like a broad perspective, you can achieve a lot more because you'll see a lot more and you'll, you'll feel a lot more versus this constricted feeling that nobody likes. And a lot of times with negative emotions, if you think about it in your daily life, like negative emotions are constricting. And that doesn't mean that all negative emotions are bad or that you should never feel them because we need negative emotions. But yeah. if that becomes you know, your, your primary narrative and your primary source of energy, that might be something to rethink a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously you do a lot of work on the mindset space and the behavior space, which is why I'm really happy that we get to talk mm -hmm. about this stuff. Cause there's not a lot of people that I can chat about these different topics with. I like to dive back though into the, the nutritional component. So mm -hmm. for the people that are listening, that are interested in eating plant-based, but that are into endurance space, what are potentially some nutritional guidelines that you can offer them for them to be able to keep their performance up, right? Where they're not racing, where they just have to like stuff their face because it's a race day and you want to perform. Like mm -hmm. where they want to be able to kind of train this way, but be able to fuel themselves properly. I would say that the number one problem or mistake that most endurance athletes make that are plant-based is that they don't eat enough. So you don't, you shouldn't stuff your face, you know, so that you're so full and you don't feel good. But a lot of times, um, people will change their diet and their portions will be the same as before, but the calories will be less. So yeah. making sure that you're eating enough, um, and what is enough, right? Like what is enough protein? What is enough carbohydrates? And I don't want to kind of get into a macro. Like, I think you, you, you guys have coaches that can really help people, um, in that regard, but yeah, make sure that you're eating enough. And if you feel hungry, eat something. And I think that a lot of times athletes, you know, especially endurance athletes, like they're trying to get their body as small as possible so that they can go fast uphill. And that isn't necessarily healthy. And I used to, I used to always be trying to lose, like, I got to lose like five pounds so I could be lighter so I can go faster. And now I don't ever think about weight loss. I just think about, um, am I fueling myself properly? And if I'm hungry, am I eating? And if you're eating a whole foods, plant-based diet, like your body is going to get to where it needs to go. Um, so not restricting yourself, I think is really important when you're an endurance athlete. Yeah, absolutely. If not, there's no, there's no fuel in the gas tank for you to keep going. Yeah. Right. And I mean, I, I definitely eat a high carbohydrate diet, probably maybe compared to other people. Um, but that works for me. Like I feel really good whenever I, I'm eating and, and that might mean like I'm not eating as whole food as I, as I could be because I need more calories. So instead of like Faro, for example, I might be eating like pasta that's made of faro. Um, so it's a yeah. little bit more processed, but it's, I can eat more of it and it's a little, little bit higher in calories. And I think people also aspire to have this like perfect diet. <laughs> and that's also not going to really be helpful for you if you're always aspiring for perfection. Yeah, absolutely. Especially during a race, right? You just, you're biking or running or swimming or whatever, and then you just start to bonk and you're like, Pfft. I don't care what food you have, right? As long as it's vegan, of course, you're like, yeah. just give me all of it, right? Like the bars, the dates, the bananas, the oranges, you're just stuffing yourself with whatever you can find. So I think the the idea of perfection is skewed for a lot of people because it means something different to everyone, mm -hmm. right? Do you, um, that's just a random question. Do you consume like the gels, like the goo gels, or do you do like dates with nut butters and all that stuff? I've tried doing dates with nut butters, but I, in a race situation, I need to eat, have the gels. Um, yeah. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just, there's, there's just too much like fiber in the dates, but for training, it's sweet. <laughs> for training, I love stuff like that. And like, I'll make cookies and, and, you know, I don't use sugar in cookies, but I'll use, of course, maple syrup is like a sweetener, but it's not as like processed as sugar, yeah. but I'll use, and instead of like, um, oil, I'll use like a nut butter, but yeah, like I eat lots of cookies and baked goods that I make at home or my husband makes. And I love things like dates. And I also will have like gels and chews and things like that. The, the more intense the effort, the more simple I need to get with the food, but I like eating real food as much as possible. Yeah. I, I do miss those days. We're just like a long bike ride. You just pull out your cookies and your stuff from the back <laughs> of your Jersey. 
<laughs> yeah, I did that today. I like stopped and this guy came by. I was like, cookie break. <laughs> What's um because you're in Squamish. You ever been to Sunflower? Uh-huh. Oh man, I I was spending so much money there daily. <laughs> the donuts are <laughs> the the donuts, their lattes. The lattes or lattes are really good, but they have some really good pastry, a vegan sandwich there. Um yeah. they know yeah, my so... husband by name there because he goes in there for the sandwich all the time. <laughs> nice, nice. You're Jamie, the owner? Yeah, I don't know him. Oh, okay. So he's he owns like I think two uh, another restaurant in Squamish, but yeah, my favorite spot. Ivy and I would go there like every single day. I'm yeah. I'm glad that you um mentioned that because I think a lot of times people will think, well, I'm eating whole foods plant based, therefore I can't eat a donut or a croffle or a pastry. But there's room for that too. It's just making sure that that's not the only thing that you're eating. <laughs> Absolutely, as long as it's not the majority, of, yeah, of the food you're consuming. Because you know you've interviewed some some big names as well, but like Dr. Clapper, Dr. Greger, like all these doctors that are whole food plant based. Like sometimes they're stuck at an airport and they gotta eat something that's not whole food plant based, right? Like it's not about the idea of eating 100% plant based all the time is sometimes you can have those moments where you can enjoy yourself and there's nothing wrong with it because your body's not going to be made up of donuts. It'll be like one donut throughout the whole week, for example. Yeah. I like yeah. thinking about trajectory and data points. And even with my own kids, like I, we do our best to cook the healthiest, most wholesome meals we can, but there's the odd time where it's like, maybe they're eating like white pasta or white rice with some stuff or, you know, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> it's about all the data points. And if you have many, many data points and then put a trend line through it, you just want that trend line going in the right direction. The only exception is if you are trying to actively like reverse a disease and you might need to be a little bit more strict. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I've had so many people that are, that I've spoken to that are SOS. So salt, oil, mm -hmm. and sugar-free. And then <laughs> Dr. <Dr>. Chef AJ. <laughs> yes. And then we talked to them and then they just said like, oh, I had like fried food last weekend, but now I'm getting back to it. I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. talk about got salt, oil and sugar. Like you pretty much ate like almost all of them in one sitting. So, you know, there's a time and place for, for, for these things. But ultimately, if you're trying to be SOS free, whole food, plant based, whatever it may be, like you're not going to be perfect the whole way through and being understanding that it's OK if you're not. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that comes back to that self-compassion piece, too, and that comparison piece, like whenever you look at somebody else, like you might look at like someone on Instagram and assign all the best things that you think that they're doing. And that's not the case. Like I, I, I do that too. Like I'll see, um, another professional athlete. And I think to myself, they must be, you know, training so hard. They must feel good all the time. You know, yeah. all these things that I wish that I had, and that's just not the case. And we do that with diet too. Like we'll look at somebody that has, you know, the perfect, whatever, like body composition. And we think like, well, they must never eat a donut. And like, they probably have had a donut here and there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, especially they're sleeping 10 hours a night. Their nutrition is top notch. Yeah. That's why they're winning races. And so, yeah, ultimately everyone gets hit by life multiple times throughout each week, ultimately. Um, so, so I like to add, uh, add on some words of wisdom. Um, so I always like to ask if you had the opportunity to talk to your younger self before you kind of started this, this athlete plant-based journey, um, and you had to kind of condense a lot of the knowledge and experiences that you have now, what would you share with young Sonia? I thought about this today, actually, because I was watching, well, I started watching this tennis documentary yesterday and I thought back to, you know, being in high school and playing tennis and saying out loud, I wish that I knew today what I knew back, you know, while I was playing tennis and like knowing yourself, like taking that journey of, of knowing who you are and what makes you tick and that whole mindset and all the mental skills, like really investing that in that younger and no, I didn't even know that that existed back then. Like that would have been so helpful. Um, and then number two, like don't put limits on yourself. Like a lot of times we'll let somebody else's limit dictate how we live our lives and think of the things that you miss out on you wait for somebody else to pick you to say that you're good enough to do something. And if you just go after the thing, then you'll realize that you are good enough to do it. And, um, yeah, it's, it's so hard to, to retrospectively go back and cause like, I wouldn't take away anything because that that's made me who Obviously. I am yeah. today. Um, but if you have a yeah. shot, if you have a shot, if there's a young Sonia listening and you have a shot of instilling in her some of that knowledge, I think those are really great pieces of advice. But I think, I think one more is like flexibility. Like it's like, you don't have to 
choose a path and then do that forever. Like my, like I have my master's in engineering. And then I walked away from that to be a pro mountain biker. And then I'm actually doing a second master's degree starting in September in applied positive psychology. Like you can pivot as many times as you want and that's okay. Absolutely. As long as it's something that you enjoy, which is the important yeah. part. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think that's really powerful. And so for the young Sonia that's listening to the episode, here's some valuable piece of advice. And the other thing I find interesting about piece of advice like this is they mean something so deep to you because you have the history of experiences to back it up. And to someone new, it's just like the first time they encounter fire, you're like, hey, don't touch the fire because it's going to burn you. And then they don't know because they've never touched it before. Mm -hmm. And so like I get the depth of the knowledge behind it. So hopefully it connects with young Sonia that's listening. Um, I just want to say a massive thank you for taking the time to, to jump on a, on a podcast with me. I know it's super sunny <laughs> in Squamish right now. So I appreciate you staying inside and recording with me. Um, and I will put, uh, actually, where can, where can people find you? Where would you like to kind of like send people? Yeah, like my website's a good place, sonyaluni.com for anything, coaching and courses and newsletter and my podcast if you want long form stuff. And if you want cool pictures of biking and some wisdom to go with it, you can go to my Instagram at Sonia Looney. Beautiful. So for the people listening, again, Sonia has a coaching program. Go and check her out. If you connect with her philosophy and her training, go hire her, right? I have multiple coaches on the platform. At the end of the day, we're all on the same mission. I want everyone to win. If people don't connect with me and they connect with you, they go with you. I want them to be plant-based and I want them to succeed. So I'll put all her links down below so you guys can go and check her out, show her some love and some support. And Sonia, thank you very much for jumping on the show. Thanks. And thanks again for coming on my show too. Yeah, of course.